soft. Where does Jesus, the one who was nailed to that cross, 
Where does that reign in your life? And as men, what does that mean to exalt the cross, and how are we to apply that to our lives? I'm going to give you four reasons to why we should exalt the cross. And my number one reason is we must exalt the cross because that is where our Savior gave his life for our sins. When we say Jesus gave himself up to us, gave himself up for us, what is what are, what does that mean to you? Are we talking about him as a physical man dying on a cross for us? Just like many people during that time were, were nailed to crosses. A crucifixion at that time was the uh, the most serious uh, form of execution by the Romans at that time. Or are, are, are we talking about something more deeper than that? When we say Jesus gave up his life for us, we literally mean he gave up his entire life for us. And some of us want to ask, what, what did that life look like? Before Jesus gave up himself, we, we know that he was in heaven. Right? He helped create the universe. He was worshipped. He was home. He was the center of everything, and everyone knew who he was. Everything was created for him and through him. He was where he was comfortable. He was on his home field of vantage. But he gave up all of that to come on the road and to come into a world and to a society that wants nothing to do with them. John writes, in, John writes in his first chapter, John 1, verses 10 and 11, says he came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. He came to a world that was made for him and through him, and the world did not recognize him. Elvis sent John Elway is walking down the downtown streets of Denver and no one recognizes him. Or Michael Jordan is walking in front of the United Center and no one says, who is that guy? Jesus came to the people that he came to do a favor for. And they rejected him. Have you ever done a favor for somebody they didn't even take it seriously? We don't want you. How many of you have been rejected by people even though you came to do them a favor? Jesus was even rejected in his hometown he grew up in, Nazareth. In Matthew chapter 13, 54 and 58, it says he returned to Nazareth, his hometown, when he taught there in the synagogue. Everyone was amazed and said, where does he get this wisdom and the power to do miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just like the carpenter's son. And we know Mary, his mother, and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. All his sisters live right here among us. Where did he learn all these things? And they're deep, they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. And Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among his own family. And so he did only a few miracles there because of their unbelief. His hometown rejected him. His home on earth where he walked as a child. And wherever you, wherever you guys are from, I'm from, because like if I'm go back to Corona and they rejected me because I'm different. How many of you have been rejected because you're different? 
In giving himself up, Jesus gave up his divine privileges out of humbleness to become a man. Jesus was all God and all man. But he did not think of himself to be equal to God, even though he was the Son of God. And even though he and his father were the same, he did not consider himself equal to his father. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, 6 through 8. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. And said he gave up his divine privileges, he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. It was hard to get you guys up here for a weekend for a retreat. And when you go home, you're going to have the same job, right? You're going to have the same job title. You're going to have the same position came up the mountain on this week. Jesus here is given up his position in heaven to come as a humble servant to serve and not to be served. Matthew 20, 20, 28. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, to give his life as a ransom for many. How many of you would give up your lives for a ransom? A price tag has been paid and you said, you know what, I'm going to pay that fine for that person. His life was given as a ransom for our sins, for our disobedience to God. My second point, why must we exalt the cross? Because that is where love was poured out for us. Jesus Christ gave up his life for us on the cross because he loved us and his Father loved, loved us. And Jesus tells us how great his love is for us when he says in John 15, 12 and 13, This is my command. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. That's how much he loves you. No greater love than for one to lay down his life for his friends. Love each other the same way I have loved you. Meaning the same way that we are loved by Christ, we are to share that same love to other people. You want to exalt the cross in your life? Start loving other people the way Christ loves you. Whether they deserve it or not. Did we deserve his love? But he loved us anyway. He had every right to say, you know, Father, I don't want to go to that cross. Let them rock up. He had every right, even up to the moment the night of, he said, you know, Father, I respect your will. Why do I want to go through this pain for these guys, which I know half the world is not even going to believe me anyway. But if you look in this room, these are who he loves. This is who he loves. He goes on to say in verse 13, no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. In early translation, the word friend can also be referred to as brother or brother. No greater love for a man to lay down his life for his brothers. And Jesus gave up his life because he loved his brothers. Who are his brothers? Raise your hand if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You're all a brother of Jesus Christ. He 
died for each and every one of you. Some people may ask, well, he said this 2,000 years ago. How does this affect me today? John chapter 17, Jesus is praying to his father the night of his arrest. Right before all the events that would, lead, that would take place leading up to his death, he says this in that prayer, John 17, verses 20 and 21. I am praying not only for these disciples, meaning the 12, 11, 12 currently, but also but for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will be all, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. He is praying this, he is praying there, not for only the disciples that are there currently, but he is praying to all those who would believe through their message. Someone told you about Jesus Christ before you became a believer, correct? Someone had to tell you about Jesus, right? And every disciple from that Garden of Gethsemane to today, those are all the disciples that he prayed for. You and I are those disciples. When we say Jesus was thinking of us while he was on the cross, that is what we are talking about. He was thinking of you. And he loved you so much that not only did he die for you, but before all the pain and suffering you would endure, he took the time to pray for you. He did, so he did not leave you out on what he was about to do for you. Uh, Ed, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was praying for your salvation. Vince, Jesus was praying for your salvation 2,000 years ago. And all of us here. Not only did Jesus love us, but the Father loved us. The God of all the universe loved us. We all know this verse, John 3, 16. You want to say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. If you believe in Jesus, you are loved by God. Our Heavenly Father, he has given us his Son because he loved us. Point number three, why it must be exalt the cross? Because that is where forgiveness was shown to us. Somebody has forgiveness. Forgiveness from what? We have been forgiven. We had to be forgiven for the sin that separated us from God. A penalty had to be paid. A sacrifice had to be made to completely be forgiven of our sins. You know, the sacrifices that the Israelites would do before Christ, they were they were just simply covering the sin. But the slaughtering of the animals, the slaughtering of the lambs, they were simply to cover the sin. They didn't remove the sin. Only a, only a holy sacrifice could do that. A perfect sacrifice. A man with no sin had to be that sacrifice. And that man was God's own son, Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, this is where he talks about you know, men are all evil. There's not good in any of them. And he says in verse 25, For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood. The sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he, when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. Every sin that you, you will commit, 
every sin that you have committed, they are all forgiven for if you believe in Jesus Christ. Think of the most horrible. Think of the most horrible thing that you have done in the past. Maybe you got drunk one day after a Super Bowl party and your team lost. And out of anger, you said something that was so hurtful that it hurt someone's feelings. Or God forbid, next week you go and you cheat on your wife. Those sins are already paid for by what, what Jesus did for you on the cross. And that, now, does that mean that we have the license now to, now to go and sin? Absolutely not. Brother Rudy, Brother Rudy last night said, you know, if, you're, if you claim to be a Christian, but you have the mindset that you're going to sin again, that's not the appropriate mindset. But we know deeply that we are still human, that we still are going to make mistakes, we're already been forgiven. And we still have to go through the process of praying, asking God for forgiveness, and realizing what we did was wrong. And if someone cut you off on the freeway, you give them the finger. You know, that's already been that's already been forgiven. But in the end, you know that God's grace is so deep. That sin cannot be any deeper. Yeah. God's grace is already there to take its place. You know, it's like an executive order. It's already been established before the act is already there. In Colossians chapter 1, 13 and 14, where he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. You are his because there was a price tag for your soul and Christ paid for that price. Done painful out of love and grace. Now, some of you may be uh, some of you may be still going for this retreat, but your salvation has already been paid for. My last point this morning, chapter uh, number four, we must exalt the cross because that is where life begins. What do you mean life begins? Aren't we alive now? The Bible says we are spiritually dead until we acknowledge what Christ did for us on the cross. Life does not begin the day you were born on this earth. It begins the day you give your life to Jesus Christ. I'm sure we all have that date saved in our memory, right? That day that you celebrate once a year is not the day that your life began. It is the day that you gave your life to Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3, You were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to be, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of his powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we are subject to God's anger just like everyone else. Those of us who were at the men's conference last summer, we talked about how that we are spiritually dead and there's nothing we could have done to save our salvation. Because of our sins, we were subject to God's wrath. We were subject to an eternity in hell. But as we read on, Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loves us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life, and he raised Christ from the dead. It is only God's grace that you have been saved. That's where life begins, gentlemen, at the cross. And even though we are dead in our sins, 
Because of our own actions and disobedience to God's law, He still gave us life through His love, mercy, and forgiveness. When He raised His Son from the grave three days later after He took the nails for us. And not only does not only did God raise His Son up from the dead and gave us life, let's finish reading Ephesians 2, 6 through 10. Where He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms with, because we are united in Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in the, all future ages as examples of of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all He has done for us who are united in Christ Jesus. God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this, it is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's master, God's masterpiece, and He created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. God raised Christ from the dead. He raised us from the He raised us from the dead, and He seats us with Christ Jesus in the heavenly realms. That's not pretty awesome. Isn't it? I don't know if any of us will get the opportunity to visit President Trump in the next four eight, eight years. But, but if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a seat in your name in the heavenly realms of Christ waiting for you. Salvation is a gift, not a reward for our good works. It is a humble gift. It's a loving gift. It's a Valentine's Day gift. It's a heartfelt gift for me and for you. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things He planned for us long ago. You know what Paul is referring to there? He's referring to the life that Christ originally gave up for us. And we get a part in that. He is referring to the very life Christ originally had, had and gave up for us. It's going to be fully restored and we have a part in it. And it all starts by acknowledging what Jesus did for you on that cross. And believing in Him as your Lord and Savior. Our theme scripture this week in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Says, Therefore, since, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set for us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. He's your Vince Lombardi. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured of simple people that you won't become weary and give up. You want to exalt the cross in your life? Start training like a champion for you. You don't win the Super Bowl by just showing up on game day. You start a training camp, right? Start living your life for him. You know, one of the we're going to have a couple uh, small groups starting up. One of them is called Discipleship Essentials. 
You want to know what a disciple is? What a life of a disciple looks like? I think Vince, you're going to start one this year. Ed's going to start one this year. You're going to start one. Ask somebody about getting one of these studies. Get involved in a Bible study. Start coming to church regularly on Sunday. Football season's over after today, so there's no reason for you to miss out. <laughs> and then if you really want to exalt the cross, you go out and you talk, to, talk about Jesus to somebody else. Even if they don't want to hear it. Plant that seed. I'm not talking about you going out in the harvest crusade and preaching like great glory. I'm just asking. If you learn about the discipleship, it takes one person, a relationship between you and one person, and that multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. Go out and preach the gospel to all nations. We we'll learn that in discipleship as well. Before I close, I want to give this opportunity. I believe later today we're going to have an altar call. An altar call is when you an opportunity for you to rededicate or give your life to Jesus Christ. But if you want to make that recommitment now, I'm going to make that opportunity for you now. If you want to give your life to Jesus or rededicate your life to Him, I'm going to play a song for you in the next, and during the song, if you want to come up here and pray, or if you want to ask a brother around you to pray, I want to invite you to do that. Do not leave this mountain without reconnecting with Jesus Christ. The devil is waiting for us at the bottom of the mountain, ready to, in, you know, with all these demons and all the traps that he's about to set, he's waiting for us. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. So if you want to make that commitment, rededication, I want to make that available to you. Maybe a couple of prayer warriors want to come up here and help pray. If there's anything else that you need prayer for, this is a time to do that. Prayer is important role as a, as a disciple because you are talking directly to God. You don't need a service to call God from this mountain. So maybe if you can start from that song a little bit, I'll say a prayer, and then um, we'll go ahead and, and do that. Lord Jesus, we come before you today, Lord, and just thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us, first and foremost, by taking the nails for us on that cross. You love us, Lord, you forgave us, and you've given us new life. So, Lord, is anybody here that doesn't know you well or wants to rededicate their life to you, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to their heart and may your Holy Spirit be in them to make this decision. Lord, to some of us that have drifted away become prodigal sons. But oh Lord, as that story ended, you're, you welcome us with open arms and with grace. Bring us back to you, Lord. Bring any of us back here. Even though there's 99 sheep in the farm, you still go out and look for that one lost sheep. So Lord, I pray that anybody here who is battling this decision but the enemy is in them, Lord, trying to persuade them, Lord, I rebuke that right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that when they leave this mountain, they go and they start living their lives for you. So, Lord, we ask you to be with us, be with us the rest of this day, the rest of this weekend. And we ask you, Lord, that we just open our eyes and open our hearts to you, to receive you and receive your word. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen.